All right, how many of you have had CISS 143, which is a database class? Okay. What do you remember from CISS 143? It's an honest question. There are no right or wrong answers. I'm not going to go back in time and change your grade for CISS 143 if, if you don't say something good. If you don't remember stuff, you don't remember stuff. It's hard to remember stuff if you're not using it. So, what did you, well, okay, let, let, let's put it this way. What did you, what did you talk about in CISS 143? Normalization. Normalization, all right. I should probably make a list of some of these words because we're going to go back and we're going to visit them. sure you probably did some stuff in access to uh, but really this is I think the key points of this class so you have up here pretty much um, what I would expect or what I would hope that you got out of this class now next class or two we're going to take a little bit of a break from ASP.NET and Razor pages and talk about uh, databases because then sort of what this is going to lead to is us taking data from databases and showing them on ASP.NET Razor pages. But before we do that, we want to make sure we have our database ducks in a row. We want to make sure we understand the stuff from, from databases. So um, this is a good list. Uh, we're going to encounter all of this in this class. Um, and... Uh, and then go from there. All right. Um, let's start. I put this one off to the side. Let's start by discussing why databases are better than their alternatives. Okay. I think it's always um, important you know, not to put the cart before the horse, to um, think about, like, why we're even doing this. Why, why aren't we doing this some other way, all right? And one of the alternatives to relational databases is flat data, all right? What do we mean when we talk about flat data? Okay, flat, yeah, to just define it, that flat data could be uh, like data on a spreadsheet, where you simply have rows and columns of data. So, if you had something
anything about students, maybe you'd have the student number, the name. A list of classes they're taking. With the number of credit hours in the title. And maybe another class they're taking. And so on. You might have, and in the old days what you had is you had a collection of these files. You might have a file for students, you might have a file for courses, you might have a file for graduation applications. All these were sort of their separate little silos that contain data. All right. And it wasn't easy not saying it was impossible, but it wasn't easy to relate the data together. In other words, you as a programmer had the right code to match up the data from one file to another. All right? Like, let's say there was another table that had the professors in it. So maybe this is student data. There might be another flat file that had the professors in it. And professor 5678, Mike Zellers, Office BU211J, teaches CISS243, teaches CISS216, web development and so on. You had to actually write the code to match those up. All right. It wasn't something that was really automatic. It wasn't as straightforward as it is. Now, we already started going down this track, but what is the problem with data? Why are relational databases better than this method of having separate filos, each file, file being kind of its own silo containing a group of data? Yes? It's better organized. It's better organized. All right. Uh, anyone else? Stuff is kept in one place. So instead of a bunch of files, we have a single database. All right? That makes it easier to connect things. Easier to make changes. Easier to make changes. Why, why, why is it easier to make changes? Because you can make a change in one spot, have it change in multiple spots, but it also gets rid of anything that's repeated, so you don't have to make multiple changes. Okay, exactly. When it was originally the word redundancy was used. And what you're talking about relates to the lack of redundancy in relational databases. Here, for example, let's say we change the name of CISS uh, 243 from web database integration to something else. Advanced web development, let's say. We would have to change that here and on every student record, all right? And then we'd have to go and change it in the professor data as well. So I think that's getting to what you meant when you said better organized. All right? Things are such that you're not going to store data in multiple places. Ideally, one piece of data should be stored in only one place in a relational database. All right. So those are flat files, and we'll come back to these when we start talking about some of the disadvantages of flat files, and we start talking about the advantages of relational databases. 
what do relational databases have that make them better than flat files? And I would expect part of this is partly review. I would hope this is largely review for you. Uh, but I think it's important. I think it's important to hear another uh, instructor's take on databases. You know, you had CISS 143, that's great. And it sounds like you picked up a lot of stuff in it. But I can give my perspective on it. And hopefully between the two, you get a better picture of the whole, whole way the databases work. What do databases have that sort of get around some of the problems associated with flat files? Keys. keys. One of the things is keys. All right? In databases, is everything stored in, we talked about everything being contained in one database, but we also <coughs> talked about the data being organized. How is data organized inside a database? By relationships. By relationships? Relationships between what? Between the tables. And sometimes we use the word entities. So the key thing in relational databases that gives them their power and gives them an advantage over these flat files where everything's sort of its own silo and is very difficult to relate things together, not impossible, but difficult, is that you store data separated into separate entities. And in addition, now you might say, well, that's what we have here, right? We have students and we have professors. Not really. I might have called them that, but there is more than one entity in each of those things. All right? So in relational databases, data is stored in separate entities. And not just the entities are stored, but the relationships between entities are stored. Okay? And how's that done? That's done via keys, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute. And it also deals with the one word that was thrown out, cardinality. Relationships typically have a cardinality. So we're not just storing the data, we're storing the relationships between the data. What advantages does this give us? What, is, what are the advantages, then, of relational databases? Okay, it's easier for, and, and this is keeping in mind that you're talking about a well-designed database, right? Because you can, you can make a, a messed up database also. So when we talk about the advantages here, we're talking about the advantages of a well-designed database. Well-designed ba database does two big things. And the first one you sort of hinted at there, a relational database, in a relational database, you have more flexibility to combine data in different ways. And it's easier to do that. Okay? You can do that because of the way the data is split into separate entities and the flexibility of the language SQL. So, while it's possible with flat files to relate data together, it's difficult. All right? So number one, the number one advantage, or one of the advantages, I will say the number one advantage, but one of the key advantages of relational databases is that It allows for more flexibility in querying the data. Study of data. 
databases and in the study of information technology in general is a couple key words are data and information. Now, the general public might use those words synonymously. I talk about, do you have the data on the new house? Do you have the information about the new house? But in IT, we differentiate between those two. We differentiate between information and data. What is the difference between information and data? Information is something that you can use to make a decision, and data is just raw. Right. Data is simply raw facts. Information is something that is the raw data presented in an actionable way. What do I mean by an actionable way? Actionable sounds like one of the made up words that you'd, you're not sure if it'll give you credit for in words with friends and it might not. But actionable means that you can take action on it. You can do something with it. You can look at it and just say, you know, you, you can look at it and it goes beyond, oh, that's interesting. But you can actually do something about it. All right? Um, a weather report is an instance of actionable data. Not that you can go and change the weather, all right, but you could take steps to prepare. If you live in Florida and you hear that there's a hurricane coming your way, all right, you could, you know, make sure you have bottled water. Um, I don't know, what, what do you do? In, has anyone ever lived in Florida? What do you do if a hurricane's coming? I don't know. I assume there's certain preparations you take. Let's think about Ohio and blizzards. That one I know about, right? If you're in Ohio and you hear a report that there's going to be a blizzard tomorrow, you might like figure out, like, well, can I call off work? Um, I, I, first, I, I thought I heard lizards. Lizard, yeah, well, that too. If you found that lizards were going to be invading the state, the exact same thing, all right? That would be something actionable. All right, you would, you would get your uh, lizard guns out and make sure you were ready for the attack of the giant lizards. There's actually a giant, uh, there's actually an episode of WKRP, I don't know if anyone remember that, like old sitcom from the 70s, where their, their teletype machine was broke and the bee was broke, and the news reporter read on the air that a giant lizard was going to be attacking, was going to be hitting Cincinnati, so... That kind of cracked me up when you said that. It reminded me of, of that. At any rate, it's actionable data. You can do something about it. If I, if I see the weather report this morning and it's 40 degrees, but the weather report says it's going to drop to 20 and we have a foot of snow, well, I'm going to make sure I wear a heavy jacket, boots. I might throw a shovel in my car. I'm going, I might like, make sure I stop and get some food you know, so that we have food in the house and so on, all right? I can take action on it, all right? That's the difference between raw data and information. A good example of that, an example I always use is, what if we found out that a company sold $350,000 worth of merchandise in a month, all right? So company A sold $350,000 worth of merchandise in a month, last month, August. What can we do with that? Is that good or bad? Could guess their yearly sales. Okay. All right. But that number, 350000 of sales last month. Is that good or bad? Well, I think the answer that I'm hearing is with that piece of data by itself, we don't know much. 
right? Because there's no context. So that is a piece of raw data. $350,000 worth of sales. All right? Is that good or bad? I don't know. If that's Microsoft, then people are getting fired over that, right? If that is the business that I'm running out of my garage selling photographs that I take, then I've hit the jackpot, right? And I'm living it up, all right? So it depends on things. So what are other pieces of data that we could use along with last year's, or I'm sorry, last month's sales to be able to draw some conclusions about whether the company was doing good or bad? What are other pieces of data taken with that? Sales from prior months. Sales from prior months, right. Uh, if you did $400,000 worth of sales in July and $350,000 in, in August, well, you're slipping a little bit. All right? M maybe. Maybe not. All right? What might also you want to look at? Competitors. Did your competitors go up or down? Maybe there's a recession, all right, and your sales dropped from 400,000 to 350,000, but your competitors, their sales dropped in half, all right, and took way bigger of a hit. Then, yeah, you might not be happy with only with making a little bit less, but you, at least you're doing better than your competitors, so you're, you're, doing about as well as possible. What other pieces of data might help you conclude that? Your costs or the overhead? Your costs, right. So if I sold $350,000 worth of goods, my cost for $250,000, yeah, that's good. All right, earned $100,000. If my cost was three hundred fifty and, and my expenses were seven hundred thousand, oh, then we have a problem. We might want to compare with our budget. How much did we expect to sell this this month? All right, to see if it's good or bad. We might want to compare with last year's sales. Maybe we're a seasonal item. Now August is sort of a bad example. All right, because August is still part of the summer and so is July. But let's say we are, I don't know, what would be a warm weather thing? Let's say we're Cedar Point, all right, and we compare August sales to September sales. They probably drop a lot, drop off a lot between August and September, right, simply because that's a seasonal thing. Or like anything associated with the holidays, you know, uh, a lot of retail stores do a lot of business in December. If you compare their December with January, they're bound to take a hit in January and drop their sales a little bit. But that might not be that bad, right? Because they, they expected that to happen because they're, they're a seasonal sort of business. The point is, is the, one of the ways that you take, or, or most of the ways that, you t that involve to take and take a piece of data and make it meaningful is combine it somehow with other data. Competitors data, last month, last year, budget, expenses, all those things are taking and combining that one piece of data with other pieces of data and then maybe you can make some conclusions. Like, well we sold a little less than last month but you know what, you know, normally we have sort of a weak month in August so that's not that bad. All right. We actually only expected to sell three hundred thousand dollars worth of goods, and we sold three hundred fifty thousand dollars. So, yeah, even though we dropped a little bit, you know, we still did better than we expected. So we're happy. All right. So you can combine data. You can summarize data. All right. Um, for example. Um, In an organization, sort of the higher up the organization you go, you have people interested in really big, big picture issues. All right? So 
the CEO of a company might not care about every person that's late paying their bill. The CEO isn't going to call on the phone and try to hit them up for the money that they're owed. The CEO may be interested in looking at how many overdue people you have by branch. So you might combine the data. So if I'm $100 overdue, CEO doesn't care about that. But if the Cleveland branch has $50,000 worth of overdue accounts, they may care about that when you take it in total. So you summarize data, I guess is my point. You summarize the raw data into totals and look at that. Look for exceptions, right? In other words, if I'm managing, let's say, the Ohio division uh, of, the, uh, of, of a certain company, I may only look for branches that have uh, something out of the ordinary. Like maybe there's a branch that seems to have twice as much expenses as another branch. That's an exception. So I'll look and I'll say, well, you know, why does it cost you so much to do things compared to these other branches? So you might not look at every piece of data, but you might look at exceptions. Here's the bottom line. The more capability you have for taking data and combining it with other data in a flexible way, the better information you can give. So this, this flexibility in querying data leads to better information. Because we're, we don't have to just see data one way. We can see the same data presented a bunch of different ways and use that effectively. There's two kinds of reports or queries typically that are run. There's sort of the regular scheduled reports that are run. You know, maybe every week you run a uh, accounts due balance report for the credit manager. And they look at and, and see maybe what branches have a lot of outstanding payments due and, and so on. Then there are ad hoc queries. What's an ad hoc query? Something, I'll hesitate to use the word random, but something that is like unpredictable. And something that you may do once, but not ever do again. All right? These regular queries that you perform repeatedly as part of an organization are for the normal business operations. The ad hoc queries are typically done by upper management. You sort of have in an organization people on three levels. Strategic, tactical, and operational. Typically this is the upper management. These are the non-management workers, typically. And here would be sort of middle management. And there might be some managers included in this category, too. And this isn't my like clear cut. Like on any given situation, someone may sort of bridge the line between two areas. All these people need information to do their jobs. Operational people are more interested in the day-to-day -day running of the business, making sure that the things that the business normally does get done and happen on time. So accounts payable that pays the bills for the organization. All right? They 
have probably some routine that they go through is they process each bill that comes in and maybe once a week they cut checks. So they need a very regular sort of reporting and data or information coming from the system. Upper management is typically more interested in strategic or longer range or planning operations. They are more involved in getting sort of the ad hoc queries, where they may be working on analyzing, gee, would it be worth it for us to open up a new branch in such and such place? All right? So, enrollment services at LC would be on the operational level. They want to see how many people are enrolled and and so on and so forth. Very regular sort of thing. All right? At the top, upper management is where strategic planning will come in. Might be something like, do we open a different satellite campus here? We have one in Wellington, one in Lorraine, one in uh, North Ridgeville, and so on. Maybe their task will be, should we build a new building on campus or open up a satellite campus somewhere in, what's another city in Lorain County? Uh, in Amherst. All right. In which case, that's not something they're going to do every month or every year or every 10 years. That's a one-time decision. Probably will never address that situation again, that exact situation again. So, the kinds of queries they want are going to be off the wall, ad hoc, all right? Where they're one-time things, you're going to get that data, and you're going to use that to make a decision. The bottom line in all this is that an organization has a variety of informational needs spanning across the different levels of the organization. And therefore, the easier and the more flexibility you have in generating queries of that data, the better information you're likely to be able to provide. So that's one of the big advantages that relational databases have between, uh, as compared to flat files. Because the relationships are already there. The developer doesn't have to do anything special to figure out how to link data from this flat file with data in that flat file. What if I were to say this? Relational databases. lend themselves, and again, this is if we do it properly, obviously we can mess up with databases too, to more accurate data. Why do I say that? Why do I say that relational databases lend themselves to more accurate data? Any thoughts? Yes? Because when you're making changes, it's harder to overlook things. Okay. Here's what I here's here's what I am hearing you say. Uh, one of the things about relational databases is we've eliminated redundancy. So No redundancy means only need to change in one place. If you get back to what I had up on the board before with the flat file where CIS is 243, 
web database integration was several places in the data. If we had to change that there, we'd have to change it in a bunch of different places. And guess what? We're going to mess up at some point and not change it. And therefore, our data is going to be inaccurate. Let's say we change the number of credit hours. or we got the number of credit hours wrong, all right, we'd have to go back and change them. And we might not correct all of them. And we might not change all of them. And therefore, some students will have three credit hours, some students will have four credit hours. So you don't have that with relational databases because we eliminated the redundancy. That piece of information, the name of the course or the number of credit hours is only stored in one place. Something that's stored in one place can't be inconsistent, right? It might be wrong. Relational databases don't prevent you from making a mistake or spelling someone's name wrong or putting in a four when you wanted to put in a three. However, to correct that error, you only have to correct it in the one place. So if we look and we say, oh, CISS 216 has four credit hours, it's only supposed to have three, I don't have to hunt for all the places where CISS 216 is stored and change the number of credit hours. I can just change it in one place and it's correct. So if it's wrong, it's wrong all over. And that might sound bad, but to correct it, you only have to correct it in one place and that will take care of everything. There's another thing about relational databases that add to the accuracy of the data. Any thoughts on what that is? The type of data you're storing, what fields you've assigned to that. Okay. One thing that really helps is the fact that relational databases you, you store not just the data, but you store a description of the data. So, for example, you store the data as a number, the number of credit hours. In a flat file, typically you don't have that ability, right? You could store it, you could intend to store it as a number, but if someone has validation problems in their program, you might store X credit hours instead of four credit hours. You might, it might accept alphabetic data. So that's one way that you get more accurate data. Yes? Would be with the primary key and the foreign key? Exactly. It is with what is called data integrity. And there's a number of different kinds of integrity. That was one of the data type. But one of the chief ones is what's called uh, relational uh, integrity. And what that means is if you have two tables that are related together, that data has to exist in both tables. All right? Back in the old days with flat files, we had a customer file. We had a customer number. Let's say we had customer number 100, 200, 300, and so on. And they all had the customer name and other information. In our order file then, we had the order number and so on. All the other data associated with the order, the date it was placed and so on. And we had a customer number. Now, a flat file will allow you to put anything in that. I could put cusp for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on. We had controls in our program to make sure that a valid customer was entered. All right? But guess what? That caused 
so so we, our program forced them to enter a, 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 a correct customer number. <coughs> but guess what? There's things that you didn't think of. First of all, what if there was a bug in our validation? We might be able to put in an order for a non-existent customer number. What if we could delete a customer and that would leave that order sort of orphaned? All right? Or what if we could go and change the customer number? to something else that could also leave a customer orphan. Now, back in the old days when I, we had this situation, we tried to write our programs airtight to catch any of these problems. So that if you deleted a customer, it looked and made sure that there were no orders for that customer. If you changed the number of a customer, it would go and find all the instances in the, in the order table and change the number there too. And we couldn't enter a order without a valid customer. We tried to do that through our own programming skills. Guess what? Didn't work out very well. All right? Because every single program that involved orders and customers might have the potential to screw up the customer number and change it without hitting this file. We had to get that right every time, and we didn't, all right? And therefore, we had, when we ran reports and analyzed it, we had hundreds, if not thousands, of orders that didn't have a real customer associated with them. Well, that's not good, right? How do you know who gets credit for the sale, you know? if you don't know what customer it was? How do you know what, who to send the bill to if you don't know what customer it belongs to? How do you know what salesman gets commission? It's a mess, all right, if this relationship breaks, all right? One well, of the oldest sayings in information technology is garbage in, garbage out. If you have bad data, you're not going to get good information from it. How is this compared to relational databases? In relational databases, when you store these entities, you also store a link between the two. So you will have a customer table that has a customer ID and all the other attributes. You make that the primary key, which means no duplicates. All right, and everyone has to have one. You have an order table that has an order number as a primary key, other attributes, and has a customer ID as a foreign key that points to this foreign key. It doesn't just point to it. That restriction is built into the database that you can't have an order that doesn't match up with a customer ID. You just can't do it. You can't enter a new order. Depending on how you set up the foreign key, you can't enter a new order that has an invalid customer number. You can't delete a customer if they have orders. And you can't change the number of a customer if they have orders associated with them. Now, there's some variance in exactly how you handle that. But the point is, is the database is responsible for implementing and ensuring that this relationship has integrity. That you don't end up having orders sitting out there floating in space that don't have any customers associated with them. You don't have to depend on every single programmer that ever touched any of these programs getting it right. All right? 
the database protects you from bad programming in this context. If the database is set up correct, you can't possibly violate what's called the referential integrity. All right? And then it goes really far into making sure the data is more accurate. So we're not going to have ghost data out there that we don't know who it belongs to. All those relationships are there. Now again, keep in mind, that doesn't mean, that doesn't guarantee it's going to be 100% accurate. A given order might be supposed to be for customer 100 and someone actually accidentally puts it in for customer 200. And that might be wrong. So you don't eliminate all errors with relational databases. But at the very least, you can only put a valid customer in there. So you know it's not outlandish. And if you find a mistake, you only have to correct it in one place. You don't have to correct it in several places. Questions about this? All right. Normalization, what is that? <coughs> you said you learned about this. I have it on, on, on audio and video recording. I can play it back to prove it to you that you said you learned about this. So what is normalization? Okay, it's how you normalize data. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me, there's, there's definitely normalization rules, and we'll talk about them, all right? But let me give you a different slant on normalization. Here's some of the goals of normalization, all right? Number one, that each piece of data is only entered in one place. That's a goal of normalization, right? So if I have a customer's phone number, the customer's phone number only lives in one place. So if the customer, I don't have a customer's phone number on the order, all right, because that would be two places for it, on the customer table and on the order table, and that's not good, all right. If I have the customer's phone number, it's going to be on the customer table, not on the customer and the order table. Because if I have it in two places, it could be inconsistent. It could be inaccurate, all right. So that's the first consequence of normalization. Every piece of data is stored in one place. Now, keep in mind that that still applies with foreign keys, right? You might say, well, I have the customer number in the order table. Well, yeah, that's a distinct piece of data. I'm not saying there is such a thing as customer 100 and here is their data. I'm saying this order's customer is 100. So that's a unique piece of data, that this order belongs to customer 100. All right? And that's only stored in one place. All right? Second thing, another way to define normalization is to make sure that we've identified all the entities, all the attributes, and all the relationships between those entities correctly. That's the goal of normalization. With normalization, all right, if, you, if you've gone through the process of database design and you haven't defined, you have, and you're missing one of the entities that you need, you haven't done the job right, all right? If you've done the job of database design and normalization correctly, when you are done, you have identified all the entities. You've identified the relative attributes, and you've correctly identified the relationships between the entities. If you've done any of these things wrong, you haven't done the database design correct. I think I have some exercises here. And that might be a good thing to end class on.
Yeah. Here's what I'd like you to do for the remainder of class. So you have about a half hour. Break out into teams. All right. Let's imagine you have data in a flat file that looks like this. This is meant to represent This is rep meant to represent the different computers that we have on campus. All right? And let's imagine this being a flat file or a spreadsheet. Maybe someone keeps track of the computers in a giant spreadsheet. And here's what the spreadsheet has. It has a computer ID. There's actually a tag on each computer. There really is from LC, like giving an ID number. There is a location where that computer is. This first computer, for example, is in BU 106. BU, of course, is the business building. But there's other buildings on campus, too. The description of the room, BU 106, is the open lab. BU 210 is the Cisco lab. We have a year for a uh, year purchase for the computer. So this computer was purchased in 2003, 2004. You can tell that either I haven't updated this example in a while, or we're really behind in purchasing computers. All right. And then finally, we have a list of applications that are on the computer. This first computer has Microsoft Office, which has a code of MSO and a name of Microsoft Office, and a second application called Petri. This has uh, an uh, MS Office and Macromedia Flash. This is old. This has Visual Studio and so on the line. Your job is to develop a relational database that contains this, that could contain this data. All right? Should be in normalized form. We shouldn't lose any data. All right? In other words, the year the computer is purchased belongs somewhere. The fact that this computer has these three software packages needs to be stored somewhere. All right, so we can't lose any data when we normalize it. So what I want you to do is, is get together groups of a couple people, all right? If you're really feeling antisocial today, you don't have to work in a group, but I would encourage you to. Take the next 20 minutes, half hour, develop a relational database, and we'll start discussing this on Thursday at class. All right, rest of the time, work on this. At 10.30, we'll head into lab.